the end of this session regarding redistricting. Please be advised that the session will be video and audio recorded to be sub subsequently placed online and made publicly available. This is not a typical meeting of the House or Senate committees and will not be attended by all committee members. This meeting is occurring in Belknap County at the Belknap Mill. Staff the General Court has worked to secure places to hold these sessions statewide. And I'm grateful to staff and the organizations that control the use of the facility for allowing us to use them. And a big, big thanks to the General Court staff and committee services. They have to get here early and make all this work somehow. Thank you guys for that. So this is a meeting of the Senate and House Redistricting Committees. As a result, we have members of both the House and Senate here with us tonight. Senator Gray, would you introduce me to the Senate? Uh, thank you. I think I can talk loud enough that uh, Mike would be able to pick me up too. Uh, I am uh, James Gray. I am the chair of the Senate Special Committee on Redistricting. Uh, Senator Birdsell will be back in a minute, and I'll uh, have her introduce herself in a second. Uh, but I do want to say a couple of things. Uh, Senate rules uh, don't allow you to cheer, clap, or boo. Okay, so we don't we don't want any outbursts. If you want to say something, the mic will be here. We will accept input on redistricting from everyone in the room that wants to speak. So please refrain from other expressions. Uh, as I said, I am the chair of the Special Committee on Redistricting, and uh, I'm also the chair of uh, Election Law and Municipal Affairs, and the Vice Chair of Health and Human Services, and I've almost damped enough that Senator Bergsell <laughs> is back, so we'll give her the microphone for her to introduce herself. Hi, hi, my name is Regina Hortzell. I'm State Senator for District 19, which encompasses the towns of uh, Hampstead, Derry, and Windham. I'm Vice Chair of Election Law and Chair of Transportation in the Senate. Thank you. I'm Representative Stephen Smith, Sullivan County District 11, and Deputy Speaker of the New Hampshire House, Vice Chair of the Committee. Representatives, please introduce yourselves. Sure. Good evening. Uh, Representative Len Turcott. I'm from Barrington, uh, Stratford County District 4. Uh, I'm a senior advisor in the House Majority Office. I serve on this committee, Labor Committee, and Finance. Good evening, I'm Marco Smith. I represent Durham and Madbury in Stratford County. I serve in the meeting for this committee on the House Judiciary Committee. Good evening, and thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Lucy Weber. I represent Cheshire District 1, so the lower right hand corner of the state. Uh, well, the left hand corner is depending on which way you're looking at it. Uh, the towns of Walpole, Westminster, Chesterfield, and Kingsdale. And in addition to this committee, I serve on health and human services and elderly affairs. Good evening. I'm Paul Bergeron. I'm from Hillsborough District 29, which is National Ward 2. And in addition to serving on this committee, I serve on the House Election Network. I'm Travis O'Hara, I represent Belknap District 9, Belmont, and Laconia. Additional this committee, I'm on transportation. Hi, I'm Bob Lynn. I'm from Wyndham, New Hampshire. I uh, represent Wyndham in the, in the House, uh, and I'm on, in addition to this committee, I'm on the House Finance Committee. Good evening. My name is Wayne McDonald. I represent uh, Rockingham County District 5, which is the town of Londonderry. In addition to serving on this committee, I also serve on the election law committee in the House as the vice chairman. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, as this meeting will be placed online and is being watched, I want to take this opportunity to speak to the overall process, particularly in the House. Um, information on the redistricting process can be found on the general court website. Once there, if you look down a little and to the right, you'll find links for both the House and Senate redistricting committees. There you'll find past meeting minutes, upcoming meeting information, and any other documents that have been uploaded. Uh, one of these, we don't need that. I'm going to try to shortcut this whole thing. 
Uh, one of the things you'll find, among other things there, is a link for meeting minutes and recordings. And that's where the video that is being taken here tonight will be found. You can also find them on YouTube, House of Representatives. Redistricting is a process that occurs throughout the country over 10 years after the federal census is completed. The population data is used to create districts for representation at all levels of government. Here in New Hampshire, our Constitution says that the responsibility for the creation of those districts is that of the legislature. The districts to be redrawn in New Hampshire will be Congressional, Executive Council, State Senate, State Representative, County Commissioner, and delegates to the State Party Convention. There are handouts here tonight with some information for you. That information is more detail on Belknap County. From the House Representative side, it would be helpful for you to comment on things that you might think are important for the district in Belknap County, but you can, of course, make comments on other districts also. We've done this event in every county. And my, my own nuggets, the reason we're going out to talk to people that live here is some towns naturally do business together. Um, some towns, like in my district, without four-wheel drive and eight inches of ground clearance, you can't drive from one to the other and stay in the county. It's those nuggets that we can't get by looking at a map that we really want to hear about. Uh, there are sign-up sheets for people who want to talk. Microphone up here for you to speak into. And since we're recording, it's particularly important that you use the mic so that the sound is picked up. With that, let's get going. First up, and I apologize in advance, I am a habitual main butcher. Uh, looks like John House of Belmont. Good evening. Good evening to members of the Special Redistricting Committee. My name is Don House, and I'm a resident of Belmont, New Hampshire. I created Warrant Article Number 26 on Fair Nonpartisan Redistricting that appeared on Belmont's March 2021 town election. This Warrant Article passed with a strong majority of voters expressing their preference for a fair, nonpartisan redistricting process. 74 other towns in New Hampshire passed similar resolution. Transparency and fairness are crucial to restore voter confidence in our election process. My view of transparency and fairness is the following. Many hearings should be open for remote testimony via Zoom or other technology. One-way streaming is not sufficient. Forcing voters to come in to indoor meetings, restrict participation, and forces voters to choose between their health and democratic process. I ask you to offer this option for future hearings that are scheduled. Draft maps should be available with sufficient time for public review and commentary. I want to see the maps before your committee votes on them. When will these maps be available? An independent, nonpartisan group of New Hampshire voters should endorse any final maps that are recommended. Four, five towns within Belknap County qualify for their own separate representative according to the New Hampshire Constitution. These towns are Meredith, Gilford, Captain, Tilton, and Gilmington. I would expect the outcome of this process to provide these towns with their own representation, not shared with other towns. And finally, my view of transparency and fairness is that districts should be competitive and reflect communities of interest. As a Belmont soldier, I expect the end result of this process is that Belmont will continue to have two of their own state representatives and continue to share our territorial district with another town or city within Belmont County. As a Belmont County resident, I would like to see less fragmentation of our various voting districts. Belmont County is a small county and doesn't need to be carved up into so many different districts. In the U.S. Congregational District, Center Harbor is part of District 2, and the rest of the county is part of District 1. For the executive council, three towns are in one district, and the rest are in another. We have three Senate districts. This is for a county of only 50,000 people. I think it would be better served with a congressman and one senator. As committee members that have been given this important responsibility, you have a choice ensuring democracy can be done in a fair and open process. 
I hope you choose this option and avoid the pitfalls and controversy that were associated with the process of 2011. In closing, thank you for listening. I look forward to the opportunity to provide feedback on the draft maps and other similar sessions. And I hope you will be sharing information about the next steps in the process soon. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Claudia Ferber, Gilman. <laughs> Good evening, uh, members of the redistricting committee. My name is Claudia Ferber, and I'm the New Hampshire registered voter who reside in the town of Hamilton, New Hampshire. Today, I have questions for the committee and ask you to think about how the districting will affect my community and ensure that voters in Billington get fair representation. First, why doesn't the town of Billington have an exclusive seat in the New Hampshire State House of Representatives? The Constitution says the town and city must have a population of more than 3,444 people to have an exclusive seat. Gillington meets this threshold according to the 2020 U.S. Census. Gillington met this threshold in 2010. Because of the 2010 redistricting, Gillington and Alton share two seats in the State House of Representatives and one material seat in Alton and Armstrong. Did you know that Gillington passed a warrant article for 35 years and 25 no in March of 2021 asking for an exclusive seat and a fair, transparent, and nonpartisan redistricting process? Hopefully, you read the letter, the March 15th letter sent to Speaker Packard and Senate President Morris from the town of Gillington selectmen. Mark Warren, who also serves as the New Hampshire State Senate Chaplain, Vincent Biacchetti, and Kevin Connor. The selectmen asked on behalf of the Gillington voters for an exclusive seat and a fair, transparent, and nonpartisan redistricting process. And most importantly, they emphasized without gerrymandering. Why does Gillington share two seats with Alton and one Ontario seat with Armstead? Other than sharing land boundaries, Gillington does not share any municipal services. Our tax base is quite different. One has to ask, was this gerrymandering in 2010? In Gillington, did you know that we had our own district in the past until the, until the end of 1960s and then again for a period in the 1970s? At that time, George P. Roberts, Jr., who resides still in Billington, represented Billington and served 14 years in the House and was Speaker of the House from 1975 to 1980. In 2010, as previously stated, redistricting changed things. Billington and Alton became one district sharing the two House seats and one Ontario seat with Alton and Barnstead. And next we look at why does Belknap County have three New Hampshire State Senate districts? One can travel north to south, east to west of Belknap County in less than one hour. Currently, Belknap County has towns and cities divided up into three districts, with towns and cities from Grafton, Stratford, and Merrimack counties. This does not make sense. Gilmington is currently in District 6. And shares a New Hampshire State Senator with New Durham, Farmington, Rochester, Alton, and Barnstead. The only commonality is that Alton and New, Bar New Durham have a common land boundary. I ask you as the committee to consider my following request. Redistrict so Gilmington and Alton each has an exclusive seat in the New Hampshire House of Representatives. Redistrict the New Hampshire State Senate seat so that Billington's representation is in a district with only towns within Belknap County. <coughs> and third, schedule public hearings before the legislature votes on the redistricting map. My last request is to ensure that this 2020-21 redistricting process is conducted with integrity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.
Blue Pretender is building chip. Good evening. Thank you for holding these very important meetings. My name is Lou Henry, and I live in Jonathan from my mass commission. Your redistricting task is a very difficult one, but it is extremely important. The redistricting 10 year life change means that having it done correctly now is paramount. Redistricting needs to be accomplished in a fair, non partisan Unfortunately, the previous two redistricting plans from 2001 and 2011 were not done this way, leading to much controversy and a lot of time and money spent into unfortunately less than successful attempts to correct them. So I thank you again for being here. This evening, seeking input into this process. More importantly, I thank you in advance for coming back here to hold a similar session when you have completed your preliminary mapping. In 2011, my hometown of Kilmington was constitutionally entitled to a single non shared seat in the New Hampshire House. We did not get it. Instead, we were given two seats shared at all. In one seat shared with Barnstead and all. Gilmington is a very different place than all. We share very little except a border. We do not share a school nor an executive council. The geography is different. And we are mostly fields and forests and farms with very few businesses, unlike all. We do not share a shoreline of Lakewood and Pasaki with all. Our tax structure is very different from all. Because of the total lack of transparency and fairness in the 2011 redistricting process, we had no input into correcting it at the time. This is a violation of the New Hampshire Constitution, which we hope your committee will rectify before more violations are forced on us. The next thing that could happen is placing us in a district with a non contiguous town, which would also violate the Constitution. I am including in my handout uh, this copies. Um, I am including with this statement a copy of a letter from the Gilmanton Board of Selectmen to the leaders of the New Hampshire House and the New Hampshire Senate, and also a copy of the water talk that was voted on at our town meeting in March. Based on the overwhelming bipartisan vote, 435 yes. 125 dollars in support of warrant article 18 which is titled new hampshire resolution of fair nonpartisan redistricting our board of selectmen urged that the redistricting committee um, <clears throat> ensure a fair and transparent redistricting plan without gerrymandering by holding public meetings such as you are here and that given to be given its single Non shared representative in the New Hampshire House. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, I also have a letter from two former Board of Selectmen members of Gilmerton wanted to have a statement read, but they couldn't make it tonight. So there are invited here. Yep, turn it down there. And I'll give you a copy. Oh, okay. Great. Okay. This is from Nathaniel Abbott and Elizabeth Abbott, both the Gilmerton Mansion, both former members of the Gilmerton Board of Selectmen. To the New Hampshire Redistricting Committee. For every Gilmerton resident who pays a tax bill, the fattest part of that bill is for education. When we pay that bill, it is like being forced to buy expensive new shoes or fancy bicycles. Since we must educate our children, we can take pride in that purchase because it is for our children and our future. But the situation is this for the same service of education, the Alton resident must only buy an average pair of shoes or a discount uh, store bicycle. 
they get the same result as being much less money. I feel differently about this situation as a result of Gilmerton and similarly situated town residents of all. The policies of the state impact us differently, so we are very likely to have different views on this subject. It is a disease of the current political climate that we can look at something that has a plan that has a plain truth on its face, and we can call it a stop of it. Following the path of redistricting as it is has proceeded up until now, would you like an example of doing exactly that? I would like to join the Gilbert Board Select Board in urging to the Manchester General Court to conduct redistricting to ensure fair and effective representation in the Manchester Boards without sharing them. I also join them in further urging the General Court to carry out the redistricting in a fair and transparent way through public meetings without favoring any particular party and to include communities of interest and to minimize multi seat districts. Yours truly, Nathaniel Abbott and Elizabeth Abbott. And I have included the letter from the Board of Selectmen and the Warren article. Thank you very much. Representative Silver. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, I don't envy the task that you have been assigned or been volunteered for. As you know, under our Constitution, we have 400 state representatives. Every town and every city in New Hampshire, I would be willing to bet, wants to have their own exclusive representative. You can't do that when you're limited to 400 representatives. You need to have a lot more representatives so that every town could have their own exclusive representative. I have the privilege of serving in Belknap District 2, which is a multi-town district between Guilford and Meredith. I'd just like to make sure that the members of the committee have a little, step back a little bit in history. When I first ran, in 2016, there was no party primary, and there were two representatives from Meredith and two representatives from Guilford were elected. And one of those representatives from Meredith became the chair of the Belmont County delegation. Her family served with distinction for a number of years. And so in 17 and 18, we had two from Meredith and two from Guilford. The next biennium, the election was two from Meredith and two from Guilford because they brought forth candidates. I don't even recall whether or not there was a party primary and I wasn't involved in that race. I took the time off. In 2019, or rather 2020, for the 2021 22 biennium, we had a primary, a party primary, and we ended up with three representatives from Guilford and one from Meredith, although there was there was a candidate, an additional candidate from Meredith who did not make it past the primary. So over each biennium, there's been a back and forth between two people from Meredith or one people from Meredith, whatever, and back and forth between Meredith and Guilford. I wasn't gonna to come to the meeting because I, I trust the members of this committee to do their duty under the Constitution. This is, redistricting is and has been since the beginning of our Republic, a political matter and is to be decided by the legislatures. And I'm assuming that you know your duty and you will do your duty. That being said, uh, I had been contacted by one person from Meredith who was vehement that I needed to advocate that Meredith should have its own exclusive representative. And I indicated that I thought that the committee would do its duty under the Constitution, what, however that works out with the redistricting. It so, it so happens that while I live in Guilford, I do represent the people in Meredith, and I've carried the votes in Meredith several times. I have been in touch on a number of occasions with the town manager in Meredith, and we have discussed 
how to deal with the donor town issue on school funding, where Meredith is a donor town and doesn't like it. So I'm trying to represent the, the people of both towns in my district. We have four reps. I think they all do that. I think that the multi-town districts are just a fact of life because of the limitations of the number of reps we have available. And I just urge you to uh, keep that in mind and do your duty as you see it under the Constitution, under the court cases. I don't see any problem with multi-town districts. And uh, Belknap County, I think, is very well represented and all the towns are well represented. Thank you. Hunter Taylor of Alton. Good evening. I want to thank uh, both the Senate representatives and the representatives from the House uh, for holding this session. I think it's uh, very, very important, and I'm very pleased that we are able to share with you our concerns and our hopes with regard to redistricting. Let me say at the outset, I, I am a county commissioner. I am not here as a county commissioner. I'm here as a citizen of Belknap County and a citizen of all that. And I tend to sometimes wander into the weeds. And I've got some ideas about um, some suggestions from it for you um, going forward. I think we all agree that fairness is really the watchword when it comes to redistricting. And fairness, I think, in this context has two very important components. One is we need to adhere, we need to adhere to the one person, one vote uh, rule, so to speak. Uh, the second major thing, I think, is really reflected a lot in the way in which our House of Representatives has been structured. I mean, 400 representatives, as you well know, is unusual. And I think it does indicate a uh, commitment to localized representation to the extent that it can be feasibly accomplished. And I mean, we all know that uh, we divide 400 into the census number, and that gives you the magic number to be used. Uh, for guidance in constructing the house districts. And it's not a guarantee that it's going to be 344, 3444 across the board. The Constitution itself and the Supreme Court cases indicate that reasonable deviation uh, is allowed. Now, let me make one suggestion about Belknap County. Belknap County has the fewest municipalities of any county in the state, one city and 10 towns and 18 representatives. So you've got a little bit easier task, in my opinion, to work on with regard to Belknap County. And I think the whole idea of combination districts is potentially dangerous. And let me, I don't need to go back in history beyond uh, 2000. In 2000, the legislature saw fit to create District 5 in Belknap County. Four towns, seven representatives, four towns at 40% of, uh, of the population of the county. Now, the idea of localized representation so I got shocked with that. In 2008, of the seven representatives, four were from the same town. And frankly, I mean, I think that anytime you're combining towns, that's a risk. 
Now, looking at the current situation, I, I'm very sympathetic with the position being taken by the people of Gilmanton. I mean, Gilmanton has gone at least two of the bindings in the last few years without its without a person from Gilmanton representative. And the Gilmanton, Barnstead, Alton area lends itself, I think, to a very fair uh, redistricting. If you look at Belknap County, if you look at uh, Alton, if you look at Gilmanton, and if you look at Barnstead, all of them have the magic number. All are at three, four, four, four. However, Milton is somewhat slightly over it. But if you look at Barnstead and Alton, both of them are significantly over it. I would suggest that you give serious thought to giving one seat to Alton, one seat. Gilman and one to Barnstead and a combination to Barnstead and Alton. They do share a high school. They also share a superintendent of schools. Now, tax structure is different. Uh, Barnstead does not have frontage on Lake One Pasaki. All I know the kind of impact that, that can make on the tax structure. But there is a commonality of interest there. And I think that that is fair to all concerned. I mean, I think that um, Alton deserves a separate representative. Barnstead deserves a separate representative. And Gilman deserves a separate representative. And certainly Barnstead and Alton are in close proximity and they do have the commonality of interest that I mentioned. So to me, that is a very fair solution to redistricting in that area. Now, when it comes to Guilford and Meredith, I worry, I mean, you're putting two municipalities that both deserve their own representation. I don't know whether that uh, situation that I described earlier is going to occur. And we may end up with four from the same town. We haven't yet, but uh, the three to one is, in my, in my mind, unfortunate. And here, quite clearly, Milford meets the threshold. Merit is 3% off the threshold. Now, if that, if that, if including Merit for two representatives, when they're minus the magic number by 3%. I mean, I think including them is a reasonable deviation from the standard. I would urge you to create separate districts for the two and give each one the two representatives that they deserve. Now, the other suggestion that I, I would urge you to consider, the city of Laconia, is 2% short of hitting the number that would justify five representatives. The city of Laconia is, I think, makes up 26% of the population of Belknap County. It also, if it had five representatives, would make up 26% of the delegation. I mean, that strikes me as a pretty strong uh, argument in favor of giving Laconia an additional representative. And I would add to that, uh, Laconia, the city of Laconia has got some issues, some problems above and beyond the issues and problems that the other towns, including my town, have. And I think it's very important that uh, Laconia have a strong, uh, viable, uh, delegation in Congress and be given the full number of representatives that could be reasonably uh, given and, and read the five are called for by the population situation. 
The other thing I would mention to you, and this one I've gone back and forth in my own mind, not, not that that matters really, but uh, with Tilton and Sanborn, they have at least for the last couple of uh, by, uh, by a couple of uh, census periods, I mean, shared representatives and had two representatives. Uh, Tilton clearly meets the threshold number. Sanborn does not. Yet, and Sanborn is off the number by about 12%. So it's not quite the slight deviation that I talked about earlier with regards to uh, America. But uh, I, I think if you, if you really want to give effect to localized representation, it's not a big leap to give each of those towns their own separate representative. Yeah. I hope I have not uh, carried us too far into the weeds. I apologize for the journey that sort of uh, by nature. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to share the concerns and ideas with you. And I do hope after you come up with your preliminary maps, I know that it's a, a, a burden for all of them, but it would be very, very nice for us to have the same opportunity to discuss those preliminary uh, maps when they're actually uh, put together. But with that, I mean, thank you again, and say good night. Thank you. Representative Horgan. Can you hear me with the mask on or should I, should I take it off? Or? Turn the lines off. Is that right? Is the mic on? Yeah. Okay. My Timothy Horgan, the state rep from uh, Scrappers County District 6. But, um, so it's a pleasure to be here in Belknap County. So maybe I will take it off. So, so just for the duration of my remarks, um, I actually do some written testimony which deals uh, with a plan for redistricting Belknap County. I did a very, there is some fairly nice software that the committee has, but it is not to the best of my knowledge been available to the public. 10 years ago, the software eventually was made available to the public, but it's actually quite, quite user-friendly. So that part of the process might not be as terrible as you guys fear. Um, and uh, I don't know whether the, I, it appears to me that 2020 software is probably similar, but it is, has not been made public. And uh, but of course, also, the reason one first issue of these meetings, we're having this meeting with no plan to comment on, and it certainly would be nice to have a hearing or some sort of process when, when a plan is finally uh, Finally publicized for the public and us legislators to comment on it. Um, last time, last time the plan was presented uh, right before the deadline for the call to retain bills, um, and it was basically presented as a fait fait accompli. And we had a very long session with the chairman of the committee, we read each of the districts, um, and then that was the end of the meeting. He, that was that was uh, Reverend Paul Mercy from Enfield, who actually he must have done. Must not gerrymandered it too badly because he actually lost his re-election bid uh, in 2012. So at least he was being fair. Um, first of all, for the Executive Council, the District Two is a bad joke. I usually call it the Belinsky Belt because of a very high-profile um, Executive Council who um, represented SC for most of the last ten years. We also call it the Van Oostern Belt or the Warmington Belt, and there's obviously. No, no logical reason why that district should have been drawn that way. And, um, so I hope, hope the committee will find a uh, more reasonable reasonable plan. There's a pretty good one here in this handout from uh, the Mapathon, but that's for them to talk about. Um, and for the Senate district, if you take um, the Belknap County is uh, 10,000 people over uh, what it takes to have a Senate district. So it would be probably be fairly simple to take two towns totaling 10,000 out of the district, and then you have a nice, uh, a nice district that's just the right size. Um, of course, then that throws off the other 23 districts, and that, that's uh, 
that's how it goes. We've already done pretty simply just eyeballing it by uh, putting maybe alternate Barnstead in District 6 where they are now and then putting the rest of the county in one district. So that's should be really simple. I don't worry about the effect cooking on all the other districts. So my main objection to the current plan on uh, our state constitution specifies that state representatives shall be contiguous. The current plan was put together in 2012, as others have commented, it includes a district which fails to meet even that simple requirement. Gilfred Emeritus boundaries way out in Little Lake Wind of Pisaki, and yet, as, as you know, they're one state rep district. So that doesn't meet, um, I don't think that really meets any rational definition of contiguous. We have a similar situation in uh, Stratford County, we have two districts which needed a point deep in the woods, and actually one of the two towns is New Durham, which borders uh, Belknap County. And uh, I guess theoretically, actually theoretically the law doesn't actually prohibit us from drawing state rep district county lines, but that's a very bad idea because the state reps from each county are also the legislative body for each county. Uh, it's just something all the reps know and probably um, so anyway, so definitely that district, that should never have been drawn that way. Um, also, Article 11, Part 7, the same one that specifies the Constitution, also states in part, when the population of any town or ward, according to the last federal census, has been a reasonable deviation of the ideal population for one or more representative seats, the town or ward shall have its own district of one or more representative seats. And then I'm not going to read the whole thing, and then it goes on about how to handle, quote, unquote, excess population by creating at large or flotarial districts conforming to acceptable deviations. So we we legislatures, we the legislators, we decide what is reasonable and acceptable. We do have to take federal voting rights law into account, including the principle of one person, one vote. Now in 2012, the political decision was made. It's actually, I was around, I was in the legislature, it's kind of unclear exactly who made it, but someone made the decision that they could vary by more than 10%, which is plus or minus 5%. And that was uh, supposedly justified by something voting rights law, which is actually now obsolete. It was a, it was a safe harbor provision for districts, um, for districts for basically for majority minority district, districts have a large number of uh, racial minorities. New Hampshire has, I think, no majority minority districts. Um, I guess it would be possible to draw one in Manchester or Nashua, but none of the ward, you know, they're, unless they radically control the ward boundaries, that's not going to be an issue. Actually, the commute, um, so, but anyway, they use that as a, they, that was the reasoning for the plus minus 5%. We can get away with more than that um, uh, since we have, we're, we're a small state with a large legislature, and I was kind of horrified by you know, making even larger. I think it's already um, almost unworkably large as it is. And certainly, we had a hard time recovering from the pandemic just because of the large number of members we had it made things more difficult than smaller bodies, such as the state senate and most other state, state legislatures. Um, also, state revenue districts, which traditionally they can't cross county lines, I certainly would not advise you to start crossing county lines. It's just going to create more problems. Um, and where town and city words can't be split in two. Now, our next door neighbor, Vermont, is also a small state with a large legislature. In fact, um, it's about the same ratio of, of residents to state reps um, over there as it is on our side of the Connecticut River. They got away 10 years ago with a plan for state rep districts where it's like 20% plus or minus 10, even though they have fewer restrictions. You can split towns in Vermont. The Vermont legislature is allowed to split towns in two, which you guys um, can't. And uh, anyway, first problem joint, and I actually drew up a little plan here. I don't know how much I want to bore you with it. If there's, if there, if there's a handout over the pile, I also uploaded it to the website. First problem with Belknap County is the county is theoretically entitled to 18.498 representatives out of 400. So um, they actually, at one time, New Hampshire they used to deal with that problem by having towns only have representatives part of the 10 year cycle, but that's uh, not allowed anymore. On the other hand, we don't have to worry about the ward boundaries in Laconia since this rather small city is just barely big enough for five representatives, but has six wards. So there's really not, I mean, I suppose there are probably some things you can do with it if you want to start um, 
whether you get a fire in the state and you know, other towns to make the numbers work better, but you know, there's, 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 you know, basically it's pretty easy. Just give the county a five uh, district and be done with it. Um, and uh, and I created the plan. And actually, if we have 18 reps, actually the ideal number is not 3,444, but it's 3,539 if we had 18 reps in, in uh, Government County. And, uh, and smaller number is 19, and I don't remember what it is. Um, and uh, this plan, you have to stick Center Harbor and New Hampton together because they're uh, both much bigger. Uh, and they're actually two of the other 8.8% below the uh, below the ideal ratio. Meredith, if you have two reps, it's 3.3% below the ratio. Laconia, and I'm not the first one to say it, you give it a five rep district, they're 2% below. And those are always well within the plus or minus 5%. Guilford, if you give it two reps, the deviation is 11.8%. And that was probably why Meredith and Guilford were put together to make the numbers work better. Belmont, if you give two reps, it's plus six. Um, Sanderton is a big problem because it's, uh, it shares a long land boundary with, uh, with New Hampton, but there's only the only roads that connect to anything over the three in the interstate. So I stuck it in with Tilton and then gives you two reps, and it's 1.4% over the ideal ratio. Gilmington, I gave it one rep, 14.53% over the ratio. And finally, I did stick Alton and Barnstead together with a three rep district, which of course you could have. Uh, we would want to have one for each town and then a will carry all and that would be some other deviation, but it's 4.6%. So that's that plan. Um, whether or not that's probably not the plan that's going to pass, it's not necessarily the only good plan or the ideal plan, but um, it would pass muster with, with the federal, uh, would pass muster with the federal voting rights law, um, especially since it's it's changed since 10 years ago. So that plus or minus 5% basically is something that didn't even apply 10 years ago, 20 years ago, applies even less now. You don't have to, to other considerations. Um, you are allowed to consider those. And of course, also communities of interest, all those things we talked about, um, we are legally allowed to do it. So in the last in the last cycle of represent to us that we can only look at the numbers and we had to ignore everything else. So that's uh, not true at all. We can look at the communities of interest. This will, um, and um, so that's uh, anyway. So, and the uh, other thing is, like, other things I'd like to tell you, like I'll do this is traffic county. Is I hope, first of all, it would be nice to have some sort of hearing, or some sort of process where you can actually comment formally on the plan, other than through you know the uh, through districting committees hearings with the representatives on the committee. So uh, I hope we, I hope we can do that. Right now, even though uh, maybe. Somebody, people are probably are drawing up plans because the software has been, has, I know it has been obtained. People have been working on it, but no plans have been publicized. And also, we can get out a little bit earlier. Like last year, we were only a few weeks before the filing deadline. And that's, that's not, not so much a big problem for state reps, but some of us are probably baffled by the Senate, the state Senate candidates, the district candidates. Last time, they had no idea where the district lines were going to be drawn. A lot of them were drawn in places very different from where they've been in the previous tenure cycle and probably different. Certainly in District 2, I doubt that anybody, uh, uh, I doubt that anybody was really expecting them to draw you know, a little bit from one or two towns wide all the way across the state from Hinsdale to Ramosford. That was probably a total surprise to everyone who wasn't, everybody except the people who actually drew up the plan. So I'd like, I think it'd be fair to get it just done a little bit earlier and also, uh, there's probably going to be legal challenges with any plan you draw up, and I uh, know we hate laws. I mean, we think it's a terrible thing that lawsuits, but there's going to be some, and it might be it might be a good idea to give those a little bit more time to, to play out. So I know one of the things in the federal court decisions was, especially plus or minus five percent. They, the, as I recall, they expressed some doubt about whether they thought that was unnecessarily restrictive, but there wasn't really time to to. Uh, Fight that particular issue out, and it was um, you know, it was within our purview to decide what was reasonable. So basically, they but they just sort of hinted they thought we made an unreasonable uh, determination what a reasonable deviation was. So that's uh, so anyway, that's why I would say good luck with the plan. It's a pretty good, it's a pretty difficult task, and no one's going to be pleased with the result, no matter what you do. But um, I hope 
I hope, I hope we do a better job than we did 10 years ago, which was uh, not you know, pretty ugly. So I hope it will be better this time. So thanks. Thank you. So hi, my name is Sandy Muji, I'm a resident of Merritt, and I want to begin by providing my credentials as an expert on the Hampshire Diversity <coughs> Communities. I'm an eighth generation New Hampshire native, I was born in Wilkesboro. I've spent all 70 of my summers in the Lakes region, worked at Hart's Turkey Farm in the 1960s. In the 1970s, five moved to Meredith with my late husband, where we raised our family. Of course, my Wilkesboro cousins still call me the Connecticut cousin because my father was from Connecticut and met my mother when he did a postgraduate year at Brewster Academy after World War II. My work and volunteer activities have brought me to most of the towns in the Lakes region. I know this area very well. My local knowledge is pertinent because decisions are being made that affect the rights of our citizens. The lines which are drawn connecting communities need to be executed with a clear understanding of local conditions. From Europe, all New England seems the same. And the difference between Rhode Island and Vermont are all but invisible. The entire Lakes region may seem the same from outside the region, but it's not. The beauty and intent of New Hampshire's massive House of Representatives is to provide local representation. It's part of our unique and proud tradition. When communities that do not share common interests and goals are combined into one legislative district, as with Meredith and Milford, both communities are disenfranchised. And I know that that is neither the intent nor the purpose of this commission. Although Meredith and Milford may appear similar from afar and share a common boundary somewhere in the middle of the Lumbasaki, they are unrelated in all the important ways. When Meredith had its own representatives, they were known in the community. We would run into them at the dump, the post office, and the bar at Hearts. They shopped at the local stores, knew kids at the local schools, belonged to the local service clubs. They were part of the community. I'm sure that's true for Guilford, too, although I don't know because even though I have friends in Guilford and have done business in Guilford, I don't see how they work. And that is the problem of the current configuration. The geography, which includes lakes and mountains, affects the travel patterns, and there's no natural connection between Meredith and Guilford. None. Although that location in the middle of the lake may fulfill the letter of the law, which requires a common boundary, the spirit and intent of the law are frustrated. By combining the two towns, both are disenfranchised. Right now, Meredith is underrepresented, but the same could happen to Guilford. And it's interesting because I understand that we have a, somebody who, from Guilford who's representing Meredith who spoke earlier. And I had, I got, I was on the elevator with him, asked him to put a mask on, actually, he didn't. But I had no idea who he was. And I am an active participant in Meredith Love and the Lakes Region Lodge. So I encourage you to repair this mistake and return Meredith to its own district. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. All right. Lynn Montana, Meredith. <laughs> Madam Chair and members of the Special Redistricting Committee, 
My name is Lynn Montana, and I'm from Meredith. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak at this very important public session on an extremely important subject. The constitutional nonpartisan democratic procedures of redistricting. Every New Hampshire voter has the right to expect this special committee to follow the nonpartisan and independent process for fair and transparent redistricting. Unfortunately, in 2010, Red Map, a program, Red Map, short for Redistricting Majority Project, was adopted by the Republican State Leg Leadership Committee of the United States to increase Republican control of congressional seats as well as state legislators, largely through determination of electoral district boundaries. The project made effective use of partisan gerrymandering, relying on specific mapping software where there was a Democratic majority, but which they could swing towards Republican with appropriate redistricting. The project was launched in 2010 and estimated to have cost the Republican Party around $30 million. Red Map's own website proudly sums it up best. Quote, the party controlling that effort controls the drawings of the maps, shaping the political landscape for the next 10 years, unquote. Even Karl Rove took to the Wall Street Journal saying, quote, he who controls redistricting controls Congress, unquote. This was not the outcome that the framers of the New Hampshire Constitution intended when they addressed redistricting after each census. Whether Republican, Independent, or Democrat, the majority of New Hampshire voters understand that it is advantageous to us all to have fair, transparent, and nonpartisan redistricting procedures, no matter which party holds the majority in Congress. Unfortunately, in 2011, these procedures were not only absent in New Hampshire, but deliberately obfuscated and hidden from the public by party politicians who formed the committee. And the result was a very partisan arrangement of voting districts, which quite frankly, to a great many New Hampshire voters was appalling, shameful, and very undemocratic. In 2011, decisions were made by three politicians and held in secret behind closed doors. Public meetings were held after very short notice with no maps available for the public to see. Our state legislators were only allowed to view the maps a few days before voting on the districts. Any opposition or improvements were silenced. And so we New Hampshire voters are here today in solidarity to tell you that we expect you, the newest appointed members of this special committee to act independently and without party bias when drawing up the redistricting maps for 2021 and the next 10 years. We're asking you to fix these maps and use fair methods. You can request, if you like, the organization Fair Maps. I'm sure they'll be happy to assist you if you need help doing so. Over the last 10 years, New Hampshire voters have been denied our rights to choose our elected leaders fairly due to gerrymandering, which must end now. We would like to see you restore a fair and transparent voting system in our state by 2021. And last but not least, I am from Meredith 
have lived there most of my life and voted since 1970. Prior to 2010, Meredith was its own singular voting district with two town representatives. This is not the case, nor has it been since 2011, when we were coupled together through redistricting with Guilford. Numerous other towns have also been denied their historically independent districts. Meredith needs to have our district and representatives reinstated as it was prior to 11, 2011, making it once again comply correctly with the New Hampshire Constitution. Again, thank you for this opportunity, and I truly hope that the voters of Belknap County and New Hampshire can rely on you, our newest committee members, to fulfill your duties with honesty and integrity and carry out fair, nonpartisan transparent redistricting according to the law. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lisa Merrill. Merrill. Or Steve Merrill Merrill. <laughs> <laughs> it's giving me the pleasure of signing. Mm -hmm. um, so good evening, Mr. Chair, um, the members of the special committee. Uh, my name is Steve Merrill and I've lived in Meredith for the past 20 years. I'm um, here to express my concern for the future of our church department. Over the past decades, I've witnessed the deterioration of norms and the decay of our four institutions. A deterioration which has accelerated over the past decade. A, a deterioration that began in our nation's capital, but has somehow led to our great state. Why did we let that happen? A deterioration that, if left unchecked, could undermine the very foundation of the country we all love, all of us. Certainly, one significant influence on this insidious decay has been the partisan gerrymandering, which has grown more and more powerful with the information technology revolution over the past 30 years. Modern computing technology, combined with modern data analytics, enable politicians to leverage voter data to maximize their probability of debate against the will of the people. Just as Facebook, Google, Apple can predict which ads you're likely to, to, to uh, click on, voter analytics can predict how groups of people are likely to vote. In 2010, a wave of Republicans swept into our state and boldly asserted their authority over our voting system. The gerrymandering that result left one party with an unfair advantage in the election, elections for the ensuing decade. To achieve this goal, legislators chose to sacrifice the independence of merit and many other towns uh, by taking away their representatives. Though merit leans Republican, or rather in, because of this fact, we were combined with Gilbert to form a district with four representatives. Never mind that the only border we share is across the lake and have nothing in common, share no institution, no dump, no, no schools, nothing. The obvious reason was to increase the house, uh, increase the number of house seats within our next to the name. And it worked. And it worked. And so to the gentleman, the representative who spoke before me, yes, there have been representatives from Meredith um, that uh, had won, but they're always Republicans. Because an independent or a Democrat is unknown in Guilford for obvious reasons. We don't share anything in common. Nobody would know them there. But in Meredith, an independent or Democrat could easily win. Not easy, could win. Unlikely, but possible. <laughs> so, at least possible, right? Let's not make it impossible. The results of the 2010 gerrymandering also had a profound impact on our state Senate. From 2010 to 2020, Republicans controlled the state Senate for eight of the 10 years, in spite of losing the total vote over that period. That is a combined vote of all 24 districts by about 1.6%. The Democrats needed a wave of their own to take the chamber for just two of those 10 years. In 2018, Democrats won the total vote count for those 24 seats by 8%, but only won 14 of the 24 seats. In 2012, the totals were 51 to 49 for the Democrats. Yet the Republicans maintained control of the chamber, 13 to 11. 
In 2014, the tally was 50.3 to 49.7. Pretty close. Republican, again, maintaining control this time, picking up a seat 14 to 10. Um, you heard that right. Democrats won more votes but lost the elections in 12, 14, and 16. Uh, I'm sorry, in 16, the final Republicans finally won the vote. So the count was similarly small. And you guessed that it was 14 to 10 again for the Republicans. Democrats need, needed an eight point margin to win the same number of seats. Um, and the, what, that the Republicans win, could win with a 1% margin. How fair is that? We have an evenly divided state, and yet 16 of, uh, of 24 state Senate districts were controlled by a single party for the entire decade. That's all. 10 years. One party controlled 16 of the 24. They never flipped because of the journey, the packing of votes into certain districts. For the good of our state, for the good of our people, please, please restore fairness to our elected electoral process, and please restore Meredith's independence as you've heard from so many of us. Give us back our seat. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Representative question. Nope. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Cindy Pollan of Gilmanton. <laughs> Nobody ever says my name. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I have to make up for I guess we'll call it appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. I'll, I'll be brief. So, um, Cindy Pollan Gilmington, I'm a lifelong resident of New Hampshire. Um, grew up in the North Country, spent 29 years in Farmington, and I've been in Gilmington for four years. Um, I have a question for you. I'm really curious how many of you, when you're speaking to people outside of New Hampshire, brag about our citizen government that we have so many representatives that people know who the representatives are. I know I did. When I lived in Farmington for 29 years, we had, and let me say, the population there right now is 6,930 people. We had two representatives and a senator. I saw people that subscribed earlier at town meeting, at ball games, at the bank, at community events. There were people that I knew. So when I had a question about what was going on or wanted to get input, it was really easy. You could sometimes just do it walking down the sidewalk. You would run across people. I, it took me a little bit to catch on, but I'm shocked. And all the years I've lived in Gilmington, we have zero, zero representatives from Gilmington. There's not a single person that I can run across, get to know, and have those kind of conversations. So they can't get to know me. What do I care about? And I can't get to know them so we can have those dialogues back and forth. So I, as other people have requested, would request that you restore the spirit and the functionality of our citizen legislature. I would like to once again have that experience. I had no idea how lucky I was to have that. Until it was on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for providing an opportunity for community input. I am Representative Sally Fellows. My district is in Grafton. It includes Holderness, Hebron, and Plymouth. There are three things I respectfully ask you to consider. I have a suggestion that you might find helpful in trying to keep all districts within the 5% deviation limit. This is most likely to be useful in counties with small populations where the perfect seat allocation, which is a two digit decimal number, includes a fraction close to one half. For example, Grafton County. 
with a population of 91,118 has a perfect allocation of 26.46 seats. While I was able to successfully map 27 seats, which is our current allocation in Grafton, with just a few adjustments to the con current configuration, I couldn't map 26 seats, even when using three or four floaterials and still keep within the 5% deviation from the statewide target of 3,444. What I discovered was that only three seats were below the state target. The other 23 were over. The only, only one district was outside of the 5% range, and that one was over by 5.47%. So I wondered why so like lopsided with three under and 24, 23 over. Since Grafton's allocation of 26 seats is nearly half a percentage below the perfect allocation of 26.46, there are 1,574 extra people that must be squished into the 26 seats. That's an average of 61 extra people or 1.7% of the target for each seat. If that excess were evenly distributed across all the seats, each would have a deviation of plus 1.76. The deviation of that magnitude is more than one third of the way to the maximum allowable deviation of 5%. So I think that's the key, you know, when you have um, a district whose percentage is, is close to an extra half, you have a lot of extra seats that you, people that you have to deal with and trying to get that within 5% is very difficult. My suggestion is to develop county maps based on the state average target of 3,444 people per seat, but if a few seats are a bit outside that 5% limit, test the deviation using the target that is the county population divided by the number of county seats. For Grafton, that would be 3,505. If all the seats are then within the 5%, I suggest that the map should be deemed acceptable. My second request, and you've heard this one before, is that after preparing draft maps, please provide a second opportunity for community input. It's the people who live in each town who know which other towns are part of their community. This is particularly important for Grafton County because it does not have a representative on the rate redistricting committee. And lastly, it seems to be generally accepted that public schools are an important element of shared interest. My third request is that instead of using SAUs as the school link, that you use high school of attendance for each town. The only common denominator that all SAUs provide is shared SAU staff. Some SAUs don't include any high schools, and some have districts that use two different high schools. Um, New Hampshire Department of Education publishes two high school lists, but neither of these have all the towns by the high school that they attend. Um, I developed a spreadsheet of that, and I can provide you with that spreadsheet, which you can easily sort by town or by high school if you wish to use it. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I had a call for backup on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, behind the scene again, I'm having a lot of. Uh, okay, so uh, Eliza Ledbetter, Guilford. Oh. Eliza, all right. I'm here. Oh, okay. She's coming. I wasn't planning on speaking, but after listening to people, I would like to take two minutes. Thank you. 
I had the honor to serve this county as the first economic developer when the newly formed uh, Belmont County Economic Development Council was formed in 1992. It became a model for regional development groups that now exist across the state. Uh, a lot had to do with Ray Durden, who represented this area and wanted to see what we had created as a county take part elsewhere in the state. I returned to New Hampshire after serving for a brief period of time in a similar position in Vermont. In 1992, we had unemployment in this region of 11.5% officially and closer to 17.5% unofficially. Belknap County had a challenge. What I quickly learned is that the 11 municipalities were exceedingly different in their needs and visions. As a delegation, there were differences, but we were able to work together for the benefit of all. What I found helpful as I worked to develop programs and initiatives as representatives would share local perspectives. They would understood their community needs. I doubt the reps from Guilford could elaborate on the issues in Meredith or vice versa. I spend a lot of time I live in Guilford, but I spend a lot of time volunteering in Meredith. I've been for a long time um, in, in New Hampton. Um, there are real differences between, I found when I was working, what Tilton needed and what San Juan wanted, San Juan wanted. Yet the rewarding part of all of this is when the delegation truly represented their towns, we were able to come together and we did some very great things together. We were the best flyer county the state found in 1996. We also put together municipal services. And the reason I feel we did this, folks, is the fact that every town had a representative that really understood their people. And if there was a problem, I could take them to the company or I could take them to the uh, nonprofit organization that needed help. And I'd like to see us return to that and that they each have their own voice and a person who really cares for them. Yeah. So please consider that. We have a great state um, and we, we are different. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Vermont, uh, <laughs> but they're much close, closer to being very similar. Of course, I work for a county that had more cows than people. But... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I know Springford. Ray yes. used to give out potholes that said no issue too hot to handle. Yes, and, and he once made the horrible mistake of promising to visit every polling place in this massive district on election day. And he did it. And the way that shook out was a minivan would pull in, the side door would open, the brake would come out, wave. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they would always hand me my camera, his camera, and say, "Take pictures of everybody I'm with." <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, one of a kind. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to take a powder on the first name. I can read the back. The last one, Baxley. Oh, that. So my name is Mo Baxley, and I'm from Laconia. Um, I had hoped to offer testimony um, tonight, but it's not possible to offer testimony on legislation where the language hasn't been written or is available to the public. Now, I understand the timeline um, that this committee is under legislatively, um, but I would ask and request that once the maps are done and the language is available um, to the public, even though there may not be time for you to do another um, or of the state in person, that you hold a hearing in pocket or do one online so that people can indeed offer testimony on the legislation in the district. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Harvey Malia. Oh, no. 
Uh, this one's easy. Nice spray. Ruth Larson of all. Never use numbers. I said that was okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to be really, really brief. The voters of New Hampshire and the voters of Belknap County have spoken regarding their votes in favor of fair, impartial redistricting. It will be up to you as committee members to be as nonpartisan as the voters have been. You have a choice. The choices made sometimes in the past have been less than nonpartisan. No one can make you do the right thing. It will be up to you to do the right thing. And I have confidence that you will know what the right thing is and that you will do it. Thank you. Jay Newton. Looks like it's on. Hello, everybody. Um, I appreciate you being here. Um, I'm Jane Smith Guilford, and I'm here because I think that we just you know, have a big impact on the strength and resiliency of our towns and counties and state. And a foundation of those characteristics is diversity. Um, luckily, we recently retired, but I worked with, for several large corporations where we thought diversity was really important. And a couple of reasons were it gave us broader talent so we could get really good employees and that broader outlook also gave us people with lots of different ideas which helped us produce strong better products and make our businesses uh, more resilient and i think the same thing applies to politics if we look at the um, the map of how we do it and either spray the republicans or democrats you know we favor either one then we're essentially take the chance of disenfranchising half of the people in our state who could be bringing ideas and energy and uh, into our political process and giving us better voter participation and better candidates as a result. Um, you have you, the New Hampshire Districting Committee, have a big responsibility. You will be deciding how valued the voters in New Hampshire feel over the next 10 years. By being more inclusive, you can make New Hampshire stronger and more resilient. I, like, the, like the other people that have spoken, I hope that we get another chance to see you. I, online would be fine and to, to participate a little more in the process to see what work you've done and to make, you know, give further input. So, but I really appreciate your time and thank you very much. Thank you. Richard DeMarc, Meredith. I get the lead. You did not do well. So, all right. David, hook you up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I won't take I won't take long. I will say, however, there's been a lot of talk about names here tonight. <laughs> and I have to tell you about the time I went to see a doctor and I walked into the room, he was sitting there, and he said to me, call me Adam. I said, Why would you want me to call you Adam? He said, Well, he said, my last name has 14 letters and nobody can pronounce it. <laughs> I said, Well, that would hang out of me. My last name has four letters and nobody can pronounce it. <laughs> I wasn't going to say, well, it wasn't going to say anything tonight, but I haven't seen anybody from Laconia here. So Laconia uh, has a, an unusual problem. Uh, every person in Laconia is represented by four representatives. So that means that uh, there are something in the vicinity of uh, 16,800 uh, voters who all have the same, well, have, you have four representatives, and there's no differentiation. 
And that wasn't always the way. My first time I served in the legislature was in 1971. And I represented War II, divided by wars. You don't have to do it that way. But it doesn't seem right that the people in Laconia uh, have 16,871 people representing, no matter where they live. But up in Belmont, which is next door, Belmont, I'm not sure what their population is. I didn't have time to look it up. Um, but if you add that population to 16,871, uh, they have 23,000 23, or so people forming, forming one representative. This doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so I, I think the, the, the committee ought to take a good hard look at how the representation in the city of Laconia is constructed. I realize it's difficult in the city. Uh, there are a lot of different factors involved. Uh, particularly the city wards. Um, but the wards are there, and then and we're not allowed to change the ward lines in order to redistrict. But uh, I would hope that the committee would take a serious look at uh, a forming district where uh, not quite so many people uh, have the same representative. Thank you. Thank you. Just leave it on. <laughs> Is it okay we give a hand out to everybody? There's a picture on it. That I think that oh, sure. Okay, you can hear sure. Thank you. Yeah. Everybody hear me all right with us? The mic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we'll just use it. Oh, just, yeah. Yeah. Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you, members of the Redistricting Committee, for the opportunity to talk tonight. Thank you also for taking your time. As I'm sure everybody in the room knows, you are the lowest paid employees in the world. <laughs> you guys get paid nothing for the time that you put in. So taking your evenings like this, in addition to your time in Concord, to talk to us today is greatly appreciated. Uh, it's unfortunate, I know that some of the members are missing tonight, that with today's technology, we couldn't figure out a way for them all to participate, but I myself do appreciate you coming out here tonight, taking your time to listen to our concerns. My name is Tony Carita, I've been a resident of Meredith for 30 years, I've been a resident of New Hampshire for 40 years, as I'm fond of saying is, I'm from New Hampshire, but my parents are from Massachusetts. <laughs> I moved to New Hampshire as soon as I could. I grew up in Massachusetts, but I always consider myself from New Hampshire. I have, I came here when I was a kid. I've always considered this to be my home. Uh, last fall, I became far more attuned to how things work in the marriage district area. And I'm not here to talk about what's happening in Lithuania or what's happening in Alton. I'm not here to say that you guys are not doing your job. You have the interest and the best uh, uh, intent for the residents of New Hampshire, or you would not be running and working like this for two years for $200. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, you guys don't get paid. You're doing this because you have the best interests of the residents of the state of New Hampshire. And I'm not here to tell you how to do your job. But when she ran for the, for the house, I realized that something just really didn't seem right with the way Guilford and Meredith put together. I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not here to talk about gerrymandering, I'm not here to talk about somebody doing something in favor of one party over the other. I'm not here to talk about politics. I'm here to talk about the town of Meredith. The town of Meredith, and I read this and I tried to check, fact check it and I couldn't really fact check it, that it was, we've had our own representative for 150 years. I think it's more like 227 years. <laughs> the town of Meredith was incorporated in 1768. The house was incorporated in 1784. We had a representative from 1784 to 2011 to the best I can figure. That's 227 years that the town of Meredith had its own representation. Somehow we got tossed in with Guilford. I don't know why. I've asked a bunch of people. Nobody knows why. If I was a cynic, I would think that something nefarious happened to put those two towns together. But I'm not here to complain or say that anybody did anything without the best intent in mind. Uh, the fact is, as we've all heard, the town of Meredith and the town of Guilford share no land border. As you can see on the picture in front of you, in order for the people that were running for state rep, 
to get to a common border, they had to paddle canoes out into the middle of Lake Winnipesaukee to get to a point where they were photo walk for the two towns met. <laughs> um, in addition to that, if you actually wanted to drive from Meredith to Hilbert, it's a 12 mile drive. Now in the, in the summertime, when we have all the summer residents here, and all the tourists here, that can be a half an hour or more drive to get to two towns that have been combined together for some unknown reason. In addition to that, they don't share any municipal operations. They don't share any youth programs. They don't share any sports teams. They don't have any common commercial or healthcare interests. So how we ended up combining those two towns is really kind of a question as to what the motive is. If you were actually to look at towns that actually had a common interest, Guilford and Gillington actually share a common interest. But I'm not proposing that we combine Guilford and Gillington or any other combination. And with due respect to Representative Silver's comments, we have a very easy solution for Meredith and Guilford. We don't need to blow up beyond this current number of representatives. And I'm sure this same instance where it occurs in other places, but I'm only going to talk about Meredith and Guilford. We have four representatives. And we have approximately the same population in the two counts. Now, an interesting thing also is that if you would look at property valuations, because let's face it, that's how we ponder ourselves here is through property valuations that the state gets their money. The town of Meredith has $2.3 billion in, in value for the home valuations. We rank 19th in the state. The town of Guilford has $2.1 billion, they rank 22nd in the state. We each contribute approximately $32 million to the state coffers. We contribute roughly the same amount of money. We have roughly the same property tax value rates, and we have roughly the same population. I don't think it's asking a lot for the amount of money that we present to the state on a yearly basis to say, hey, let's take those four, break it into two, give them no the representatives like the town of America has had for 227 years. And you don't have to blow anything up. All you have to do is take the four we have now, split them into two, no harm, no foul, no, no worse off for anybody. Um, but it, why do we want to do this? Why do we want to say, okay, we want to do something different than they decided to do in 2010, which you nobody know, could seem to figure out why they did it? It's in an odd hand to, to school anybody on the state constitution. You guys know it better than anybody that's on this side of the table. But if you look at the way it is right now, as Representative Silver said, we have three from Guilford and one from Meredith. If something was to come to the state that would harm Meredith and benefit Guilford, Guess how that's going to go? It's not going to go towards Meredith. It's going to go towards Guilford. We should not be ever setting up a situation where we can disadvantage one town over the other if we don't have to. And this is a case where we clearly don't have to. I am strongly urging every member of this committee, I don't care what you know anywhere else, I live in Meredith, <laughs> to take the, rep the representatives that we have now, the four representatives, split them in half, two Guilford, two to Meredith. It's representative of our population. It's representative of our, of our tax base. It's representative of the amount of money we give to the state on a yearly basis. That's all I'm asking. I appreciate the time you guys are giving us tonight. I appreciate the time that you guys are putting into this tonight. And I am sure that you are moving forward with the best intent to the best and what's in the best interest of everybody in the state of New Hampshire, not just the people in Gilbert, not just the people in Maryland, but the people throughout the entire state. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want the extra Um. I was once told that I'm worth exactly the roughly three cents an hour. <laughs> 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 um, that was an amazing you <laughs> Shall we through? Well, I'm not speaking today okay. because I let my husband speak for me. <laughs> All right. Sheet number two. Representative Lang. Representative Smith. Hey, Representative Smith. Uh, thank you, committee members. Um, I'm Representative Tim Lang. I serve here in Belknap for the towns of Chilton and Sanderton. I am also the town moderator along with Chair of the Zoning Board. Uh, as town moderator, I'm uh, just waiting to you that, you know, maybe 
Um, we have a vote on Article 25, which says that the police do fair and uh, impartial judicial. So I, I promised my voters I would bring that to you and ask that you please do that. And knowing that I know you all being my third term in the House, I'm sure you will do that as well. Um, the one other thing I will speak of is town, I served two towns, as I said, the town of Sanderton and the town of Tilton. Um, the town of Tilton, if you look at your, your demographic map, there, you'll see that they have 3,900 voters, well within the 3,444 um, needed and above the deviation mark. So I'm going to do something that most politicians won't do. I'm going to speak against my self-interest. <laughs> and I'm going to say, I'd ask you to please put a record to um, and use the overage that's in Tilton to cover the town of San and create a float between the towns of Tilton and Samerton. The reason I think this is still a good move is that the towns of Tilton and Samerton share a lot of communities of interest. We share a high school, we share a middle school, we share waters on the lake. Uh, our, the main thoroughfare, Tilton is Samerton's downtown. So I'd ask that you please consider splitting that district, having a, a representative of the town of Tilton and then a float seat for the town of Samerton and Tilton. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Donahue. Hi. Um, earlier, earlier in the evening, uh, Representative Smith was. Uh, Telling a story about uh, somebody, so I have to tell a brief story about him right now. Um, and this is a very unknown fact about him, but he happens to run the, uh, the best slot car racing track in the state. <laughs> and I've been there. The mic wasn't on for my promo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I've been there, and uh, you know, if you think he's driving this you know, expertise, you should see him on the slot track. Slot <laughs> racing track, just yeah. massive emotion. Yeah. His son is even better. Um, so yeah. Um, well, we've heard a lot tonight about uh, how under, I'm from Wilmington. We've heard a lot uh, tonight about how. Uh, undemocratic uh, the treatment of Hamilton has been uh, with the gerrymandering uh, and, the, and, and the fact that we don't have a state representative. Uh, I'd like to invoke uh, geography and history to, to argue uh, how problematic that situation is. Um, well, I think we all, we all know that we live in a special place uh, as I was coming here. Uh, and the sun was setting over, over the golden and russet leaves. Mm -hmm. uh, but another, another thing that's that's very special about this part of the world, northern New England, is that it's it's really the, the place where American democracy has always lived most, most deeply. Uh, for proof, we really don't need to look any further. And this is a famous painting I brought with I'm sure you all know it. Um, Norman Rockwell, Freedom of Speech. Um, I know this painting. Uh, and uh, this, this painting is from 1943, uh, and it, it ca captures an actual person, a working man named uh, Jim Edgerton, standing up at a town meeting in Arlington, Vermont, where Rockwell lived uh, for many years. And uh, Edgerton was a political dissenter. Um, after a school burned down in Arlington, he was the only one to oppose building a new one. Um, he's poorer probably than most people in this, in this uh, drawing, in this, in this painting. Um, and uh, his hands are probably dirtier. And, you know, if political forces were strategizing against him, if there were something like gerrymandering in his town, he might not be able to speak. But he is speaking, and everyone in this room is, is looking at him, in this room right here, is looking up at him appreciatively and listening. And these people are not only honoring democracy, they're honoring history. Uh, democracy is so cent central tenant to New England that when the French writer Alexis de Tocqueville came here in the 1830s, uh, doing research for his, his very famous book, 
democracy in America. He looked at the town meeting, the New England town meeting, meetings like this one in this picture, and he wrote, in the laws of New England, we find the life and mainspring of American liberty. So Tocqueville wrote that the town meeting was a thing you know, in New England as early as 1650. And he marveled at the democracy, which was a cutting edge concept when it was invented back in you know, the days of serfdom and feudal lords. Uh, it didn't emerge in, in, in cosmopolitan Europe, it emerged in New England. In little towns where, where narrow farmers you know, rolled the rocks uh, to the side of the field to build stone walls. And uh, um, in, in this, and this is according to Tocqueville, in this community so humble, a man might stand up in the face of a free people and embrace liberty. My point is this. Tonight, we were talking about some very small towns, but a large issue. Let's do the right thing. Let's respect New England's history. Let's respect democracy. And let's ensure that Wilmington has its own representative. Thank you. I will not be trapped by this battle combination. So, last, uh, Brian from Alton. Is it Neil, Dale, or Fire? There's so many ways to do that. Get another in the parade of the. Uh, Testimony where the last name has been hacked my entire life. <laughs> uh, Vice Chair Smith, uh, Chairman Gray, and members of the redistricting committee. My name is Brian Beal. I'm Deputy Director of Open Democracy Action, a nonpartisan nonprofit working on pro voter reforms here in New Hampshire. We were founded by Doris Granny D. Haddock, whose mission it was to end special interest control of government and return it to the hands of people. I live in Alton uh, after spending 35 years in the Monadnock region in Hampshire. You've been seeing a lot of me lately, and I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about why that is. And uh, then I'd like to make a proposition to you all. Throughout this year and part of the last year, I've been engaged in educating the public on the redistricting process, what it means to have a fair process, and ways to get better maps, create better maps that have been produced and have been produced in the last two decades. We've run workshops about the best practices for fair redistricting, featuring national experts, which some of you have attended. Uh, we've educated towns about our constitutional provisions for redistricting, and we, with our partners, assembled the Map of the Coalition, in which over 250 people have now volunteered. We helped 74 towns around the state from red towns like Alton, Franklin, Londonderry, and Ridge, to blue towns like Lebanon, Lebanon, Durham, and Keene, and every color in between. Those 74 towns represented 561,000 granite staters. With only five losses, it was only the, that's beyond the 74, uh, with only five losses, it was only available time in the pandemic that kept that number from being a supermajority of New Hampshire voters. They varied slightly in language, but those cities and towns were asking for a fair, nonpartisan, and transparent process. You can nitpick about it being a non binding resolution, but tell that to the voters who braved the pandemic to come up and vote on it, making it clear they wanted fair maps. And I'd say they took it pretty seriously. In May, the Mapathon Coalition began its work surveying New Hampshire cities and towns for communities of interest data. What we didn't get through surveys, we followed up by phone calls to town administrators. This yielded a list of 60 communities of interest, um, which the larger mapathon participants whittled down to five. The all volunteer mapping and technical team was formed as a subset to this larger group and comprised of engineers, data analysts, software specialists, and GIS mapping experts. Taking that criteria, our mapping and technical team assembled community of interest maps from the state of New Hampshire's Department of Education, Department of Environmental Services, Department of Health and Human Services, and federal and academic sources. This helped us to create the overlays that you see on our maps 
of the regional high schools, healthcare regions, regional planning districts, uh, shared municipal water and sewer, shared police and fire, and a couple of others. Excuse me, a couple of others. It's important to know that these overlays can be used with anyone's maps as they are available for the ask. In addition to the overlays, members of the Mapathon Mapping and Tech team created analysis tools which can test our maps and the maps of others to see with, where uh, there are weaknesses, mistakes, or intentional uh, manipulation. Like, Joel, like Mr. Joel Anderson's software, one of our team members, Phil Hatcher, developed a computer software tool which makes mapping suggestions based on New Hampshire and U.S. Con constitutional mandates and other factors. This has been a useful tool which has already made some suggestions that we haven't thought of. While our maps are not perfect, uh, as my colleague John Cross discussed last night, um, the, the communities of interest can be implemented and retain, um, excuse me, I lost my way here. Um, as my colleague uh, John Cross uh, discussed last night, we've proven that com communities of interest can be implemented to retain high schools, shared water systems, healthcare regions, and regional planning, et cetera, some of which you've heard asked for in these hearings. <clears throat> this community interest data, along with our maps and supporting documentation, is readily accessible to the committee, to both committees. Tonight, I'd like to take one more step and make a proposition. In consultation with the Mapathon Mapping and Technical Team earlier today, we are offering our services to the two committees. The House Special Committee is up against a tight deadline. Our house maps are nearing completion, as close as we can get to them uh, without uh, the completed re uh, redistricted city boards. We can work with you side by side um, and joining your policy and constitutional expertise with our technical expertise. I have confidence that we uh, can help this house special committee meet its deadlines, uh, allow for a seven day review period and produce a worthy product. While our DRA 2020 software had a limitation of being able to show floaterial districts, this problem has now been solved. I know that was a concern for some of you. The DRA software allows for the manipulation, excuse me, not manipulation, the implementation of many useful tools, including overlays, additional data sets, and other tools not available in Mr. Anderson's software. While the Senate has more time to create its Senate and Executive Council maps, we have proposals ready to analyze, which improve competitiveness and compactness while being sensitive to communities of, uh, communities of interest. New Hampshire has a long tradition of volunteer contributions to developing legislation. I'm hoping that the House and Senate committees will give up our serious offer of technical support, consideration, and together we can share maps that we can all be proud of at future hearings. Thank you for your time and service to our state uh, for being committed to a fair, nonpartisan, and transparent process, and for logging all of these miles to listen to the input of your constituents. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Looks like that's all we have. So, with that, we will close the house session. Uh, no, when we ask for from the uh, audience that didn't sign up. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen. Anybody else want to go? Ladies and gentlemen, if there's anybody who didn't sign up that doesn't want to speak, we will take the testimony. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we do have somebody who does want to testify. So if you would uh, either take your conversations out of this room and sit down and uh, listen intently. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Madam Chair and members of the Special Redistricting Committee. Uh, my name is Jim McFarland from Meredith, and I volunteered to create a board article at our March town meeting for the New Hampshire resolution for fair, nonpartisan, and transparent redistricting 
in 2021. As in 74 other towns, this resolution was passed overwhelmingly by Meredith's voters. This is a powerful and clear message to your committee that voters across political spectrum care deeply that this once every decade redistricting be done fairly and impartially with no gerrymandering. Our District 2 representative, Jonathan Mackey, testified at our March town meeting on the record to support the restored mirror to our own district with our own exclusive representative. Transparency is crucial to restore voter confidence lost in 2011, partisan, secretive, and unfair redistricting, which favored the party in power. Transparency means the following, software algorithms and criteria that will be used must be public. Why is this not yet available? Number two, 2020 census data for redistricting must be shared fully and openly with the public. Why is this not so? Number three, committee meetings must be open to the public with at least seven days advance notice. Detailed redistricting committee meeting minutes must be promptly posted publicly. The hearings and listening sessions should be live streamed and recorded and available on the, the committee's website so that they are widely accessible. Your meetings and county listening sessions like this one should be on Zoom to allow those unable physically to attend to safely participate. Why are you not allowing this during a pandemic? This committee must release your draft maps with sufficient time for public review and response. Proposed drafts of maps must be shown at a second county listening sessions across the state for public response before they are voted on and adopted. Soliciting the contributions and review by professional nonpartisan redistricting experts to assist the committee with the process, structure, and criteria employed in redistricting challenges as the preceding speaker just proposed and offered to the committee. Your maps must for submittal to the legislature for final vote to approve it must have a consensus of approval from New Hampshire's voters. Without this, voter trust in you, our leaders, and democracy will further deteriorate. You can and must restore your voter state and defend democracy in New Hampshire. No gerrymandering, honor your oath. Specific to Meredith, per the November 7, 2006 Constitutional Amendment, on, the, on New Hampshire House redistricting, your committee must honor this amendment and restore Meredith to our own district with our own exclusive House representatives. To do otherwise is to perpetuate the injustice inflicted on Meredith's voters in 2011, depriving us of our rightful representation. Each individual member of this criti critically important committee must call upon your own good conscience, consider your legacy, and choose to defend rather than destroy democracy in New Hampshire. You must put aside the partisan pursuit of power and provide proof you can create truly fair maps. Thank you very much for listening. Did you get this name? Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else that wants to testify before we close the Senate hearing? With that, thank you all.